This video from the Foundation series of GMATMathPro.com covers the basics of square roots and radicals. And the first thing we're going to look at is the properties of radicals. The first one says that the square root of a times the square root of b is equal to the square root of a times b. In other words, the product of two square roots would be equal to the square root of that product a times b. The second one is essentially the same thing except for division. It says the square root of a over the square root of b is equal to the square root of that entire quotient a over b. So you can combine that quotient in, under one radical. The third one says that a to the 1 over n power is equal to the nth root of a. So for example, 25 to the 1 half power would be equal to the square root of 25 or just 5. The cube root of 8 would be expressible as 8 to the 1 third power, or just 2. So we'll look at some more examples of that in a second. Also note that properties 1 and 2 are valid not just for square roots, but any roots. So those would also be valid for cube roots, fourth roots, fifth roots. I just wanted to simplify the presentation a bit, but keep in mind that these properties are valid for all types of roots. So now we'll look at some ways that these properties of radicals can be implemented on the GMAT. For the first property, that product property, it could come up in a way like this. Like let's say we have the square root of 12 times the square root of 3. That would be the same as the square root of 12 times 3, or 36. So then that would be simplified as just 6. Or we could use it going in the other direction. We could have something like the square root of 8, and then we know the square we know that 8 is the same as 4 times 2. And from that property, it we know that the square root of a product is equal to the product of the square root of the individual factors underneath the radical. So this is the same as the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. And then we know the square root of 4 is 2, so this all is equal to 2 times the square root of 2. And you can verify this on a calculator if you'd like. Go ahead and punch in the square root of 8, and then punch in 2 times the square root of 2, and you'll see that they are actually equivalent. So one more example of that, just because it's, it's so important. Uh, let's take a look at the square root of 72. So the idea is you want to break 72 down into two factors, one of which is a perfect square. Okay, and, and there will be a few different ways to do this with 72, but let's say the first perfect square we see that's a factor of 72 is 4. So that means 72 is 4 times 18, and then this becomes square root of 4 times square root of 18, and then that becomes 2 times square root of 18. But 18 still has a factor that's a perfect square, so we could still simplify this further. So we could say 2 times the square root of 18 is equal to 2 times the square root of 9 times the square root of 2, and then the square root of 9 is just 3, so that's 2 times 3, which is 6, square root of 2. So square root of 72 ultimately will be the equal to 6 square root of 2. Now, to shorten that process up, we would have had to see that 72 is also factorable as 36 times 2. And now we can separate that out into the square root of 36 times the square root of 2, which would just be 6 square root of 2. So the lesson is, you can do it in steps if you need to. You'll still get the same answer, but really, to simplify it all the way on the first step, you have to find the biggest perfect square that's a factor of that number. Okay, now with the second property, we, again, we could use this one also either from left to right or right to left. We could have something like the square root of 32 over the square root of 8. And so the property number 2 says that we can combine these both under the same radical. So that would be 32 over 8. And then 32 over 8 simplifies as just 4. 
So that's the square root of 4, which is just 2. Or we might have something like the square root of 25 over 16. So in this one, we'd want to go the other way and say, okay, I know square root of 25 over 16 is the same as the square root of 25 over the square root of 16. And these are perfect squares that we can simplify, so that's just going to be the same as 5 over 4. And the third property that just relates how a fractional power is equivalent to a root, um, the things we talked about were like 8 to the 1 third would be the same as the cubed root of 8, which would just be 2, or 5, 25 to the 1 half would be the same as the square root of 25, which would just be 5. Okay, so you can, and again, you can convert it either way, either from a fractional exponent to a radical, or from a radical to a fractional exponent. So let's just take a look at why that would make sense. Um, a square root, so let's say the square root of 25. A square root of a number is the number that when multiplied by itself gives you that original number. So the square root of 25 times the square root of 25 must by definition equal 25. Now if we replace square root of 25 by 25 to the 1 half, then If you remember an exponent law that says if you multiply two numbers together that have the same base, you can just add the exponents. Uh, so in this case, 25 is the base, so it becomes 25, and then 1 half plus a half is 1. So that's 25 to the first power, or just 25. So we can see, to be consistent with that law, 25 to the 1 half times 25 to the 1 half must be 25. But that, by definition, is also a square root. So that's how you can establish an equivalency between that fractional exponent and the square root. Now we're going to look at the topic of rationalizing denominators. And rationalizing denominators is essentially the process of taking a fraction that has an irrational number in the denominator, like square root of 2, and rewriting that fraction in an equivalent way so that there is no irrational number in the bottom. In other words, we rewrite it so that the bottom becomes a rational number. We're rationalizing the denominator. And it's really just a matter of form. There's nothing mathematically incorrect about having a square root in the denominator, but typically in math, you don't want to have it in the bottom. And that's probably because we want some degree of uniformity in the way that numbers are presented. So 1 over the square root of 2 is mathematically the same as the square root of 2 over 2. But it's not necessarily obvious to everybody that those are going to be the same. So we just kind of have a rule that says, OK, always let's always rationalize the denominator when you write your final answer. And that way, it'll be less confusing because we won't have many different forms of a number that are essentially saying the same thing. Okay, And it's really important on the GMAT that you know how to rationalize a denominator because you might get the right answer, but then the answer choices might have it written in a way where the denominator is rationalized. So for example, if you got 1 over the square root of 2 as an answer, but they didn't have that, but they had the square root of 2 over 2, obviously you're going to be able to want to recognize that those are equivalent, so you can pick the right answer. So there's that type of problem for rationalizing the denominator. Then the second one I have here is a slightly different one. So now we're going to look at how we can mathematically establish the equivalency between the expressions on the left side of the equal signs here and the expressions on the right side. OK, so we've got our examples over on the right there. So let's take a look at how the first equivalency is established. So we're going to start with 1 over the square root of 2. And we want to write this in an equivalent way, but in a way that does not have a radical in the denominator. So we need to multiply it by something, but we don't want to change the value. And the only number that you can multiply something by and not change its value is 1. 
So we're going to multiply 1 over the square root of 2 by a form of 1 that gives us something that we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by the square root of 2 over the square root of 2. So you can see square root of 2 over square root of 2 is just 1. It's the same thing on the top and bottom. But now when we multiply that out, the top becomes 1 times the square root of 2, or just the square root of 2. And then on the bottom, we have square root of 2 times square root of 2, which is just 2. So that is all there is to it. Just So multiply top and bottom by whatever is the radical part of the bottom. Okay, now in the second example, it's slightly different because there's a 1 plus in front of the radical. So in a case like this, you have to multiply the top and bottom by what's called the conjugate of the denominator. And that means essentially, the conjugate is, is essentially the same thing except the sign in the middle is changed. So in this case, it's 1 plus the square root of 3, so we're going to multiply by 1 minus the square root of 3 on the top and bottom. Okay, now the top obviously just becomes 1 minus the square root of 3, and the bottom becomes, now we're going to have to foil this out, so we'll do the first terms, 1 times 1 is 1, the outer terms, 1 times negative root 3 is minus root 3. The inside terms, root 3 times 1 is positive root 3. And the last terms, root 3 times negative root 3 is negative 3. So now notice the middle terms, we have negative root 3 plus a root 3, so those just cancel out to 0. So we just have 1 minus 3, or negative 2. Okay, so so you can kind of see now why we would choose this conjugate to FOIL by, because that is what's going to make the two middle terms cancel out, and that's what's going to get rid of our radical in the bottom. So now we just have 1 minus the square root of 3 over negative 2. And then, uh, to get rid of the negative in the bottom, what we can do is factor a negative out of the top. So that's going to be negative 1, essentially, times negative 1 plus the square root of 3 over negative 2. And then that negative cancels with that negative. And then we can rewrite negative 1 plus the square root of 3 as square root of 3 plus negative 1, or just square root of 3 minus 1 over 